Ah, <laughs> uh, sushi belts. For those of you not versed in the Factorio lingo, sushi belts are named after those restaurants in Japan that serve different kinds of sushi all on a rotary belt so you just grab what you want. In Factorio, it refers to any sort of design that doesn't dedicate one or both sides of a belt to a specific resource. Put simply, it's when you shove a bunch of random garbage all onto the same belt. Wow, you might think to yourself. That sounds awful, and you'd be right, but there are some niche uses to this design, and this isn't one of them. I'm turning off biters and cliffs, because if I have to deal with that on top of everything else, I'm going to have a conniption. Also, I just don't think it would add anything interesting to the challenge. And so here we embark on our quest to create the ultimate sushi restaurant. To maximize suffering, I'm not allowing the use of belts for any purpose outside of the sushi belt or feeding the sushi belt, and no filter splitters either. But before we can do any of that, we need to get all the preliminary stuff out of the way. So put your hands together for the heroes of the early game, mining directly into furnaces and coal snakes. At this stage of the game, moving things by hand is far superior than trying to build any kind of automation, which is just as well seeing as I'm not allowed to build any belts yet. We grab some water, set up a couple steam engines, and then get the lab working on automation. Like I said, I'm not using belts yet, so everything is going to be hand-fed, relying on direct insertion, but you can do a lot with just inserters and chests, like this arrangement for setting up super simple belt automation. All you gotta do is throw iron into the center chest and you get belts out. I'm gonna need a ton of these, so it's best we start making them early. It also helps if you make stuff like gears and circuits to speed up your handcrafting. This gives us a slow, but steady trickle of science. Emphasis on slow, because ordinarily I'd be working on setting up a proper furnace stack right about now. But this isn't an ordinary run. And even though it looks like I'm doing nothing right now, my brain is hard at work formulating ideas on how in the world I'm going to make this thing work. The main thing about sushi belts is that they need to create a continuous loop, since otherwise all the garbage that you put on one that didn't get used would just clog up the other end. The other problem is that if I have any hope of beating this game, I'm going to need several lanes of belts, which comes with its own challenges. But here's how I've devised to load the sushi bus with oars, which will work for any number of lanes. So if you just put everything onto a sushi belt all willy-nilly, it would invariably get clogged up with too many of one item, and that's where circuits come in. What we want to do is have something that keeps track of how much of each item is on the belt and also know when to stop adding more of that item. To do this, we're going to rely on the classic memory cell, which is just a decider combinator with its output wired back in as input. Whatever signal we put into this thing will remain in memory forever, and that means whenever we put an item onto the belt, we can add it to the memory cell, and when we take one off, we can subtract it. That way we'll have a constant updating record of everything. But that just tells us how much stuff we've got. To actually limit it, we're going to use these constant combinators to set up a value corresponding to the maximum amount of each item we'd like to allow on the belts. Then we can multiply the actual count from the memory cell by negative 1 and add that to the output from the constant combinator. And if we had, say, 501 iron ore in the memory cell and 500 as the set limit, then we'd end up with a final signal of negative 1 iron ore, which we can then use to turn off the belt that adds iron ore so long as the value isn't negative. You know, just normal Factorio stuff. And as you can see, the belt supplying stone and coal are cut off before the iron and copper lane since their limits are much lower. Also, I set up electric miners on all the ore patches while you weren't looking. We've got ores on the belts, but actually forging them is its own challenge, seeing as forges can take iron ore, copper ore, stone, and iron plates as input. The easiest solution would be to use filter inserters and dedicate each furnace each to a specific resource, but we can do better. Also, I just realized that I didn't leave any space for the power poles, and now I need to rip this whole thing up. Instead of enabling and disabling the inserters, I'm going to use circuits to set their filters, so when we're low on copper, they'll allow in copper ore, and likewise with iron ore, and neither if there's plenty of both. I really wanted to make the forges totally generic and make the bricks and steel in the same way, but the glaring issue is that unlike iron or copper plates, making steel takes five iron plates. That means if the need for steel appeared and an inserter added an iron plate to the furnace, that furnace can then only accept iron plates from then on, and will only sit idle until it has enough to make steel. Then if the steel request disappeared, it would never be able to get enough iron to make the steel and free up the furnace. I tried for hours to find something that worked and came up empty-handed, so the steel and brick furnaces will need to be dedicated, but the iron and copper furnaces can share. Also, I need to add in a constant combinator that always adds in coal as a filter so they can fuel themselves. Now you can see that if I add in that I want 500 copper plates on the belts, suddenly the filter for copper ore appears on the inserters. Also, it's easy to forget, but all of my resources are coming from handcrafting, because I don't have a real base. 
And I really wish I had construction robots right about now, but for some reason I feel like that's pretty far away. It's been two hours and we're only now getting furnaces up. But hey, it works. I just need to repeat this process for every single furnace stack I want. Regardless, the beginning of our sushi base has begun to manifest, and it already looks horrible. All of these inserters are set to read contents mode as a pulse, which is carried along the green wires and fed into the memory cell. But we need to make sure to multiply the pulses from the inserters that take things off the belt by negative one, so it knows that the item was removed. If we want to see all the items on the belts, we just need to mouse over the memory cell. And you might have noticed that despite my best intentions, some of these furnaces have iron plates stuck inside of them. And that's because to set the filters, I used the red wire, and to read whatever was picked up, I used the green wire. But the item pulse also gets sent along the red wire as well. So whenever the steel furnaces picked up an iron plate, for one frame, iron plates were added to the filter of the iron and copper forges, which allowed them to get stuck trying to make steel. I can fix this by putting in a negative value for iron plates in the red wire using a constant combinator, which should drown out any errant pulse of data since only positive values can set filters. As if there weren't already enough of them, but another major issue with this design is that if for any reason an item is taken off of the belts without first notifying the memory cell, it will forever exist as a ghost in the system, and the only way to get an accurate count again would be to completely empty the belts and reset the memory cell. Boy, I really hope I don't need to do this more than once. Watching this, however, has given me the premonition that once this thing is running, adding anything to it will be a major headache. And outside of belt upgrades, it's pretty much impossible to increase throughput. So I've decided to up the number of lanes from 4 to 6. We'll also need a new 6 lane balancer, since it is very important that all the items are evenly distributed across all 6 lanes. Well, we're approaching the 4 hour mark, and I'm yet to place an assembler that isn't hand fed. But I've got some steam engines feeding off the coal on the belts. It only has access to a third of the total coal since only two belts go by it, which is less than ideal, but it'll work for now. But now we need to actually get things into assemblers, which isn't as straightforward as it sounds, since we have 6 lanes and at most our assemblers can only pull from 3 lanes per side. There is a way to get 4 lanes per side, and even 5, but it requires splitters in a way that won't work with sushi. I could split the bus in half and run three lanes on either side, but I decided to mirror it instead and let each see only half the total belts, since it leaves me more space for chests and eventual fluid shenanigans. This is the interesting part of this design. Because all of the belts are totally equivalent, adding more belts is the only way to increase throughput, but it also makes it harder and harder to effectively pull stuff off of them. If our sushi bus was 15 lanes wide, any given assembler could only access 20% of the resources on the bus. Which isn't so bad when it's a fairly ubiquitous resource like copper or iron plates, but since we're going to be putting everything on these belts, it's possible by pure chance for certain resources to just totally miss an assembler just by getting balanced on the wrong side of the belt. All I can really do to counteract this is by mirroring the recipes on each side. Also, I only have access to four inserters with this design, and if three are dedicated to picking off one lane each, that means I only have one inserter left over to actually place things back onto the bus. This whole thing relies on the bus being balanced and space being available. But if everything is getting placed in the exact same spot, not only will it be unbalanced, but it will also block later inserters if that lane is too full. The best I can do right now is add another balancer every so often. The inserters feeding into the assemblers just need to notify the memory cell of whatever they took off, but the ones putting stuff onto the belt also need to have an enable condition to only add stuff to the belt when we don't have enough. Originally, I tried having two inserters taking stuff off the belts and two putting stuff back on, since I was afraid of the copper wire clogging everything up if it was restricted only one half of a lane. But eventually I decided that the other 3 to 1 design is much better. And with the lanes fully saturated now that I had to stop the belts for construction, you can see why maintaining a healthy amount of space in the bus is pivotal. These circuit assemblers can't even make circuits because there's no room to drop the wire. After a while, the clog starts separating and you can see some circuits starting to circulate. And seeing the first of many processed resources floating lazily around the belt, it hits me just how dumb this base is. I kind of want to vomit already. At least after five hours, I can finally start fully automating supplies like inserters, assemblers, and power poles. And surprise surprise, it sucks. This doesn't bode well for the future. Also experience a nice power outage from not enough coal getting to the boilers. Instead of feeding the coal in as far away from the boilers as possible, I decided to put it in right before the boilers instead. I'm a genius. 
I had a little accident while I was tweaking the circuits and accidentally created a feedback loop, so now the count on the memory cell is totally off. Time to purge all the belts again. At least we get to watch it fill up again. Assuming YouTube's compression algorithm doesn't turn it all into cubic visual sludge. Another problem with this design? Yeah, there's another one, can you believe it? It's that unlike a regular bus where you can use splitters to ensure that everything gets at least a little bit of the resources, here it's very much first come, first serve. You can see the steel furnaces eating all of the iron plates until there's nothing left over to make green circuits with, at least until the steel reaches its limit. But after standing around for a couple minutes, it's back to a reasonable distribution. It feels weird actually having automated supplies now. I think it's about time we actually tried to make some science. This is when I switch over to that 3 to 1 design I was talking about, and it is still extremely painful doing this without robots. This should be enough for the science assemblers up until the end game. Editing the bus is a little dangerous, since removing any of the belts means removing the items on top of it and dooming them to forever exist as ghosts in the memory cell. But fortunately, we can just rotate them instead. Over here's the labs, with the same design that allows them to pull from three lanes and ensures that all six lanes are covered. I'd say this number of labs is pretty optimistic, but what can I say? I'm known for my optimism. This thing sucks so much, oh my god. Regardless, after six hours I can finally start researching the early game stuff. Very slowly. Luckily, red and green science aren't that difficult to produce. There's no biters, but I'm getting military too, just so I can make grenades to blow up trees. Also, logistics number two. Mostly so I can research cars, since replacing all of my belts with red belts is a pipe dream at this point. Unlike a regular design where you can selectively speed up the belts with high demand, with this sushi base, upgrading some of the belts but not all of them will just cause the thing to clog up when it hits the slower parts. After driving around for a bit, I find a nice oil field, which will be very important for the next step, chemical science. And let me tell you, I am not looking forward to putting fluids onto our sushi bus. The first step is automating some oil refineries and pump jacks and chemical plants. It would probably be faster to make them by hand, but that would require picking stuff up off the belt, and that would screw up the memory cell. So while those are being made, I prepare another two rows of assemblers. Hopefully this will be the last time I need to do this without construction robots. And there it is. I'll hook it up later, but if it's not doing anything, all it means is a longer round trip. And you're going to love what these assemblers are for. Now it's time to start extracting that black sticky goo. It's just like you'd expect, and all I'm going to do is run a giant pipe all the way to my base. I doubt this base will ever need another oil patch, since I expect our final signs per minute to be around 5. Then we just gotta plug it into some refineries. I considered putting crude oil on the sushi bus as well, and sending it to the refineries that way, but I decided for the sake of my sanity that fluid to fluid recipes shouldn't go on the bus. As usual, even though I don't have the recipe unlocked yet, I set it up for advanced oil processing as well, since I'll be researching that pretty much immediately. And just because I'm not putting crude oil onto the bus doesn't mean I'm not putting all the other fluids on. If it goes into an assembler, it's going on the bus. The main thing we need this for is plastic, which takes coal and petroleum gas. The gas comes in on a barrel and will be unbarreled right next to the plastic plants as the empty barrel is put back on the bus to be filled again. The plastic will be used immediately to make red circuits, and anyone who's played Factorio before has doubtless experienced their base being permanently starved for these things. And for all my 2,000 hours of playtime, I expect my base to end up much the same. That's one third of the ingredients for chemical science out of the way. Next up is engine units. And for all the problems I've been pointing out, I'd like to mention the only advantage to the sushi bus. No matter where I put down an assembler or what recipe it has, it will eventually make the item I need. Keyword, eventually. Now all we need is sulfur, and that takes water, but our sushi bus has us covered. And don't forget we need to manually put in a limit for every item we want to add onto the bus. Since my main goal right now is construction robots, I wanted to start making some sulfuric acid ahead of time. I probably should have put it after the sulfur plants, and directly inserting between assemblers almost feels like cheating, but what are you gonna do? 
These are annoying because they output fluid as well, and I need to make a bit of space to actually get it out, but then it's straight into barrels. I'm just gonna assume that I only need one of these. Isn't it beautiful? I have no idea how long it takes to make a round trip on these belts. Probably like five minutes. Without further ado, here's chemical science. And again, thanks to the power of sushi, I just need to set the recipe and eventually they'll make it. So now I research advanced oil processing and wait for the science to trickle in. There's not much for me to do right now, and I'd really prefer to just go AFK for an hour, but I forgot to enable research queuing at the start of the game, and for some reason the only way to enable it mid-game is a console command. Well, whatever. At least now I can leave and hopefully come back to fully researched construction robots. So I'm back, and you may have noticed something... off about the belts. That sure is a lot of sulfur and copper wire. What's more, our research didn't even finish, presumably because of the aforementioned sulfur incident. Upon closer inspection, it seems that this green wire was never hooked up. Which means that this whole row wasn't updating the memory cell at all. Well, it's colorful, I guess. But you know what that means. Time to purge the belts for the fourth time, yay! You would not believe how much garbage can fit on 6,000 belts. You can see the negative values in the memory cells from assemblers that were picking up items that were never added into the system digitally. Well, I guess we get to watch this again. It takes forever for the belts to even out. And finally, construction robots are finished, but I'm not even close to being able to build them yet. Our starter iron patch is finally running dry, so we need to get another one. Fortunately, there's a nice one right below us. It takes a couple belts to get there, but it works. I'd love to use red belts, but I'm currently saving those all up for the actual base. I upgraded the ore inputs and the balancer to red belts so I can get some more iron throughput. Because the ore only comes in on two lanes, if it can hit the balancer faster, it'll spread out across all six. So even if the rest of the belts are yellow, it still helps us input more iron. Also, upgrading all of the furnaces reduces coal consumption. Now, if you still don't realize how bad this base is, I'm bottlenecked not by chemical science or green science, but red science, simply because my red belt assemblers are eating all of the gears further upstream. Since I don't have enough assemblers to actually make construction robots, I get to experience the joy of building another one of these assembly lanes by hand. I made sure the green wire was connected this time. So now to actually make robot frames. We'll need lube and some batteries. I've said it before, but the best part about making robots is that it means they're already one-third done with yellow science. And you got robots. I'm cheating a bit and borrowing the sulfuric acid from the other side. And that should theoretically make robots. I look forward to having enough of them in two hours. I replaced even more of my belts with red belts, and you can see what I mean with them all bunching up. And kudos to my steam engines for lasting this long, but we're finally starting to have power problems. Luckily, now that I have batteries, I can actually start making a trickle of accumulators. They're what we need to make solar power actually work at night. Early game robots are kind of slow, though. Still, as long as there's a roboport in our tileable solar blueprint and we have some bots in the network, it'll get built eventually. This base doesn't use much power, mostly on account of it being really bad, so as long as I occasionally slap down another hundred solar panels, we should be able to keep up with demand. This will also ease off the coal demand a little bit. For some reason, we have a negative value for iron ore in the memory cell. I have no idea how that happened, but I'm just going to ignore it. Look at me, I don't need to upgrade these things by hand anymore. Well, upgrading the straightaways by hand is still faster. Might as well while I'm waiting for purple science to research. And there we are. Everything's been upgraded to red belts. Now instead of taking 10 minutes to make a round trip, it only takes 5. I should probably get around to making purple science. But thanks again to the power of sushi, all I need to do is set some recipes and a few assemblers. This base really is the jack of all trades, master of none. Then I just append some purple science to our science lane and eventually... You know, I've been saying that a lot. Where's a thesaurus? Uh, well, in the fullness of time, purple science will appear. Hey, it only took seven minutes. 
There's not much stopping us from making yellow science either. I've got some extra circuit assemblers to try and compensate for that whole first come first serve thing I mentioned earlier, considering these processor units take 20 green circuits. My expectations for the yield are pretty low. Also, we'll need some sulfuric acid. Low density structures have a very long crafting time, and seeing as we'll need them to launch the rocket as well as the yellow science, I'm squeezing in a couple more assemblers to make them. I've been playing this for so long that this torrent of garbage is starting to look normal. Well, that's everything we need to make yellow science, and at some point in the future, we'll get some. Can't forget to actually add the item into the system, though. Alright, now I can theoretically research the endgame science as long as I wait around enough. So that's what I'm gonna do. Seriously, there's not really much left for me to do here. With a design as great as this, any attempt to improve it would just take longer than waiting. The later game sciences require a ton more copper, and my starter patch is finally running out, so time to secure another patch. And why use our expensive red belts when you can just run twice as many yellow belts? Two yellow belts side-loading into a single red belt is enough to fully saturate it. I also set up another coal mine. There's still a lot of research left, but I'm going to ignore most of it and go straight for the wind condition. It's going to take forever to research, but if I start stockpiling the components to make a rocket hours in advance, it won't be as painful. Hopefully. On that note, we're making some rocket fuel. And the stuff to make military science, because might as well. Never noticed how I call half the sciences by their names and the other half by their color. Weird. Here's a new stone mine, too. With no risk of my resources running dry, now I can AFK in peace. These belts are kind of like a train wreck. You just can't look away. I forgot to set up rocket control units, but it's not like any spare red circuits were getting past the chemical science assemblers anyway. After doing this for a year, you can tell I'm really good at getting cinematic shots, like messing around in menus when the game-winning research completes. No matter, now I've got to make the rocket silo, which is a lot harder than usual because I need to make concrete from a sushi belt. Also, it's going to be about a million years before we get enough processing units, since we'll also need them for the Tier 3 productivity modules. Trust me, you do not want to make a rocket without Tier 3 modules, especially under circumstances such as this. While we were waiting, all of our belts magically turned into blue belts. That's amazing. Also, our silo's done. Might as well put it right here. Now all that's left to do is wait, and I've gotten pretty good at that during this run. Seriously, this one's worse than that explosive ore video I made. So at this point, I just left to go do something else. After coming back, we seem to be averaging a mean 6 RCUs per minute which is enough for about four rocket sections every five minutes. Some bases can be measured in rockets per hour, and I'm proud to say that this one is measured in hours per rocket. And there it is, 18 hours to beat the game in probably the worst way possible. Now some channels might be satisfied with that, but here, we like to do things a little differently. So let's take sushi to its logical conclusion, shall we? This base served us well, but I've got better ideas. I head over to the lab and start playing around with ideas until finally settling on this design. It still pulls from three lanes per assembler, but its output is on a separate belt that feeds into the lanes via a priority input splitter. So now they'll never get stuck trying to drop something onto a full belt again. I also staggered the splitters so they'll output onto the first, second, and third lanes and hopefully keep everything balanced. Which should mean I need way less balancers. Also, shockingly, there's room for beacons. The best thing about this design is that it's also infinitely stackable. My furnace setup is mostly the same, except upgraded to fit electric furnaces and beacons, as well as taking advantage of the extra width of the electric furnaces to add in another long inserter which will help keep the belts equal on both sides. But designing it in the lab and building it in-game are two completely different things, especially with a base this bad. 
It's going to take forever to get the supplies to build anything even close to the scale I'm looking for, but we'll have several hours to stockpile them while we sort out the resources. At this point, it feels weird setting up a proper train network. This so far is the only normal part about this run. But don't worry, this is just a short trip before it all gets sushi-fied. If only setting up mining outposts was really this fast. But we can do our best with some good blueprints. Well, that should be enough mines for now. Time to actually make the unloading stations. While I've been busy for the past three hours, one messed up inserter has slowly been dropping 2.6 thousand rail signals onto the belts. Really goes to show just how fragile this whole design is. Well, here's the unloading stations. The trains are all six cars long, so I can get six lanes off of them. I'm also going to set up oil processing up here since there's water. This time, we've got beacons, and we're actually going to set up oil cracking instead of just deleting the fluids whenever they get backed up. I designed this to fit in the same footprint and be somewhat tileable, but even at the scale I'm planning for, 20 refineries is probably enough. So, what kind of scale are we talking about here? Well, this kind of scale. Yeah, it's a 30 lane wide sushi bus. That's almost 900 underground belts in one blueprint. It's like our other ore input design, except scaled up a little bit. Shoutouts to my sponsor for this video, the Shadow Government. Now allow me to introduce you to the Moab, the mother of all balancers. It takes over an hour to make the blue belts for just one of these bad boys, which is why everything is using yellow belts for now. Time to paste that big furnace blueprint we made. This thing can handle six lanes, and it's got room to route another six through by the beacons, so I can put another furnace array right in front of it. This thing's pretty tall, and stacking five of these things on top of each other would have been annoying. And from here, the construction bot should be able to handle everything else. Unfortunately, the iron supply to my old base is right where I'd prefer to be building stuff, so I'm gonna need to route it right through this thing. It takes a while for the robots to make the round trip, but it's better than me doing it. Now we just do this on the other side, and that's about a third of the lanes done. Building something this big with only that dinky little base to supply us is a little ambitious. But with how I designed this thing, I don't need to make all 30 lanes at once, since all of my designs stack vertically. I wish I remembered to wire this thing up when I was making the blueprint. Anyway, it's the exact same system as the original furnaces. I am being very careful with this. I am double and triple checking all of the wire connections I make and all of the inserter settings. You've seen what happens when one inserter is out of whack, and I'd really prefer to avoid that. So now we've got to set up the memory cell, which isn't hard, but it's got me thinking. The way I was setting limits with a constant combinator works, but it's a little bit annoying, especially considering how often I need to fiddle with the values. The sushi is highly volatile, and finding the right number of an item to have on the belt requires a lot of trial and error. What I'd like is something that lets me track and fine-tune certain values, and so I decided to build one. All of this might look complicated, and I guess it kind of is, but not conceptually. It's just a bunch of latches hooked up to push buttons from the push button mod, and whenever I press one, it kicks out the previous value from the memory cell and puts itself in instead. This stuff in the memory cells feeds into two arithmetic combinators that multiply any value that passes through by that value. Then after sanitizing the output, that is fed into another memory cell which will ultimately contain all of the limits we've set, and that is shown on these displays from the Santa's Nixie Tube mod. What that all boils down to is, I can choose to add or subtract certain preset values from the limiter's memory by pressing the buttons, then the buttons corresponding to the item whose limit I want to increase or decrease. I've decided to call this contraption, The Chef, since it controls the sushi. The actual amount of stuff on the belts will be displayed too, just as soon as I can actually put things on the belts. On top of all the ores, we've got to deal with putting all the fluids in barrels as well. And it's a bit against the spirit of the sushi, but I've decided to add these filter inserters that grab all the empty barrels off of the main line and put them onto another belt. Those get sent up to our oil refineries to be filled before being routed back in sushi style. If the empty barrels don't get filled, they'll just get routed back in anyway, so it's still completely circular. We've got the resources, now we just need to do something with them, and that involves several hours of copy-pasting our assembler blueprint that I designed. 
I'm gonna be making a ton of these assemblers, and I can't really think of anything interesting to say anymore, so, uh, have a montage. Well, that's the basic structure done, but before we start pasting on the extra tiers, I've got to set the recipes, since they're all going to be the same for each stack. I'm treating each lane of assemblers as its own factory, and so I chose a rate of science that I thought I could sustain with six blue belts of resource input and tried to ratio around that as a guideline. But I probably could have cut the number of assemblers in half just because of how inefficient moving resources like this is. The sulfur and sulfuric acid took some nightmare piping, but it's good enough. This time I'm going to make sure we actually have enough circuit production. Like I said, the only advantage to this base is that at this point, all I need to do is set recipes and circuit conditions. Once I've set up all the recipes, I decide to extend it a bit so I can have some extra assemblers for making things not used in science, like belts. I'm going to be making a lot of belts, because don't forget, this thing is still entirely made of yellow belts, and despite having 30 lanes, its throughput is only 1.7 times greater than the old base because it's got 6 lanes of blue belts. But after 15 hours, we've got at least one-fifth of this thing done. Now I get to set all the limits on the chef, which I expect to tweak quite a bit, but that's why I made this thing, and now you get to easily see the limits at all times. There's one last thing I need to take care of, which is the labs, and I decided it would be cool if I took the science off one sushi belt and put it onto another sushi belt. Same concept, subtract on the main belt, add to the new belt, compare the memory cell with a constant value, and activate the inserters if we're below that value. Unfortunately, a filter inserter can only have up to five filters at a time, and there's seven sciences, but it only gets the filter applied if there's a deficiency of that item, so I'm just going to assume that it'll work. All right, now let's turn this baby on. It's going to take quite a while for resources to percolate through this thing. It's got like a 20 minute round trip on the belts. So let's start expanding it. And this is why we spent the last 20 hours stockpiling materials. Ah, that only took three hours, and you can see my sushi chef is working flawlessly. Not only can I see the limits, but I can compare the values to see if there's a deficiency of any item. That being said, this thing's just warmed up and I'm already getting some lag. The time usage debug menu lets us see how much computation time everything takes, and the main one to look at is update time. Factorio runs at 60 FPS, and this shows how long it takes the computer to process each frame in milliseconds. The longest it can take to process without losing frames is 16.6. The causes are obvious. Entity update is a given considering how many inserters and assemblers we've got, circuit network as well considering all the conditions, but transport lines is especially egregious. 
It's anywhere between 4 and 7 milliseconds. I have never seen it anywhere near this bad. Yeah, we've got like 60,000 belts, but that's still way too high. And I can tell you why. If you're curious about the specifics, you can read their blog post, but the Factorio devs are smart and they heavily optimized belts so long as there aren't gaps in the belts. Yeah, so guess what we've got across 30 lands and 60,000 belts as an integral part of the sushi design. Not only that, but we have about 5 times as many assemblers as we actually need to cover the whole bus, as well as 5 inserters per assembler with constant circuit connection. This might just be the most unoptimized way to play Factorio possible. This is way worse than the no belts run, there is no contest. That one at least managed a cool 100 signs per minute flawlessly, but this one is 5 times the size, uses my whole CPU and still barely manages that. I've really gotta hand it to myself, I've made the worst base ever. The primary evidence is that despite being this huge, this whole base has been running on nothing more than 5,000 solar panels, which means that the vast majority of these buildings are just idle. It's only now starting to strain the power grid when I'm doing research, and so I've actually got to set up nuclear power. I was putting this off because getting the sulfuric acid required to mine the uranium ore off of my sushi bus is a royal pain. And in 10 years, I expect to have enough sulfuric acid to fill a wagon. If I was doing this at the start of the run, I probably would have put this raw uranium on the sushi belts, but it's been almost 40 hours and my soul hurts. I'll just leave this running while I set up the reactor. I stole this modular reactor from someone else. I don't really know how it's set up, and I don't really care to know. I just want it to make power, and I'm nearing my breaking point. And would you look at that, we've got enough uranium to set up Kovarax. Unlike the raw uranium, I actually am going to put this on the sushi belt. Ah, nuclear power, yay. Now I can actually consider using beacons and productivity modules. My belt-making enterprise leaves much to be desired. And I'm going to choose now to mention that I have some modded-in upgraded belts that seemed like a good idea at the start of this video, but are too expensive for this horrible atrocity of a base to actually produce in the quantity that I'd need. But I am making the upgraded underground belts. Also, doesn't it look like there's way too much copper ore on the belts? Yeah, this definitely looks a little over the limit of 10,000 that I set. I couldn't find it in this 5 hour video file, so I'll just tell you that one of the copper lands was set to enable and disable properly, but not to read contents, and was slowly introducing undocumented copper every time there was copper demand. There is no way I'm draining all of these belts, so the best I can do is manually enter like 20,000 copper ore into the memory cell and assume it's close enough to the real value. For the whole playtime of this run, I think I was actually playing maybe 60% of the time. The rest of it was spent sitting around like this, but at least it's fun watching the belts go by. Ultimately, this base is still slow because of the yellow belts, and I've mostly been waiting around for more belts to be made, so I added some Nixie displays and wired them up to the RoboPort to display how many belts are in the network. As you can see, we're up to one-sixth of the total blue belts we'll need to convert everything. There's still some stuff I can do while they build up, like setting up more mines. It's a good sign that I'm actually using up all of my ore now. It means something's getting built. Then I can use the very convenient Module Inserter mod to add productivity and speed modules to everything. Only Tier 1s though, but considering we have nearly 2,000 assemblers that can take 4 modules each, even a good base would struggle to fill that with Tier 3s. I've also managed to make enough of the higher tier underground belts to let me do this. Blue undergrounds just weren't long enough to span an entire rocket silo, and I could have done this completely vanilla, but I like this solution more. Again, setting filters with signals, and when there's a demand for space science from the chef, the satellite signal gets added. We need filter inserters because while it's possible to build a rocket from the bus with regular inserters, the moment it gets built it would shove something random in it like an iron gear wheel and launch that into orbit. This is legitimately the only time I've ever encountered this issue. Let's see how long it takes this time. Wow, only an hour. And to be fair, we were building three rockets at once, and they finished shortly after. Now we just need to wait for a satellite to pass by. Any second now. Supposedly there's some in the system, but like I said, 20 minute round trip. Oh, and uh, there we go. Fully automated sushi rocket science. And it seems the other one found a satellite too. God knows I couldn't see it.
and correctly satellites have disappeared from the filter now that we've got enough space science on the belts, which are being reserved onto the science sushi belt. And there we have very colorful infinite research. Man, I should have downloaded the Disco Lab mod. After all that waiting, we're at least somewhat close to all the blue belts we'll need, so I decided to go ahead and pull the trigger. Then I spend the next several hours cowering in a field because my UPS is being murdered and not looking at anything means my game runs faster and therefore the belts build faster. I'm not too concerned that it's taking forever because I assume that the rest of the belts will have finished crafting by the time they're done replacing everything. And in due course, everything has been blue beltified. So, where do we go from here? Well, there's this really stupid mod that adds something that requires one of every item in the game to craft, and this base is practically built for something like that, so let's give it a shot. Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely every item in the game, alright. I assumed it was just vanilla items, but I really didn't like how it wanted modded items as well, including every variant of text plate. So I just edited the game file so it only took vanilla. There we go. And now for the incredibly painstaking process of selecting every single recipe in the game across every assembler, adding that condition to the inserters, then adding that value to the sushi chef to allow it onto the belts. I've got a lot of available assemblers, but this is really going to show the major problem that each assembler only sees one-tenth of the total supplies, so just getting the items that it needs is basically pure chance. I don't think I would recommend this experience to anyone. But honestly, there's just something appealing about the idea of putting every single item in the game on the sushi belt. Don't forget that it's every item in the game, even its own special assembler, and that means we need two rocket silos each, a Spider-Tron, and a Mark II power suit, just to name the big ones. With everything on the belts, anything will eventually be crafted, but again, it's mostly a waiting game up to the will of the sushi. It's important to try and not put certain recipes in the same row as another, like exoskeletons after the rocket silo, since the silo will eat all of the electric engines in that row and completely starve the exoskeletons. Now to actually try and build some of these things. They're grabbing pretty much everything right now, but I expect that to change shortly. There's also a few little things I need to add, like crude oil barrels. And uranium ore. Now the joy of manually selecting every single item we need. After a while, it's got some more stuff in it, but it's still got quite a ways to go. That means it's time to wait again. The bitrate of this video is going to be horrendous. Might as well take a tour while that builds. This base runs much better with blue belts, but it still sucks. The biggest nail in the coffin for this design is just the insane probabilistic nature of anything getting crafted. Sometimes you'll need circuits, only to see that your entire limit of iron is an entire continent away while billions of copper plates pass by. I cannot hammer this home enough. It's bad. It's horrible. You need a constant demand, otherwise all your unused ore gets past the furnaces and takes up your quota until it does a full lap of the belt. Your hands are tied. You can't do anything except wait and hope what you need gets crafted. There is zero intelligence to it. Not to mention that it's horribly laggy. I genuinely question if it's possible to make a base worse than this. That being said, I've found myself just staring at these belts, mesmerized by all the colors that pass by. I want this as a menu simulation. It's a complicated feeling. I'm both proud and disgusted by what I've created. After three hours, unsurprisingly, we're mostly waiting on the big ones like Spider-Trons and Rocket Silos. But remember, it's spread across ten assemblers, and I want to get out of here, so I decide to consolidate them to at least launch one duck. It's beautiful. And then it just kind of fades out of existence. But I got a rubber ducky out of it. Was it all worth it? No. I let the base run a bit researching stuff just to show how bad it truly is. And you can see that we're anywhere between 60 and 140 SPM. It vacillates a lot. To be fair, we're still trying to make rubber ducks, but yeah, despite having 1.8k assemblers, it's running worse than my beltless and burner bases. The only one it beats out is my dangerous base, and that one's like a hundredth the size. Well, thanks for coming with me on this journey into subversive engineering. 
And special thanks to all my patrons who for some reason fund atrocities like this being brought into the world. Remember, they voted for this. But thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.